Good morning, Uptown Church. Uh, it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, another Sunday. If you are new here, we'd love to have you just uh, put it into the comments. We'd like to welcome you. Uh, if you're not new, say hi to each other. Say um, good morning and um, welcome. I. It's still many months into doing online church and still sometimes it's uh, awkward and and weird to be like, hi, good morning on, on a Facebook Live, but I know you're all out there and uh, we just want to welcome you today and we just know that God is going to do something great uh, here at Uptown Church. I'd like to open up with Psalms 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. and the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. 
I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I just wanted to encourage you, church, this morning that as we open up the word, as we worship God, that we do not forget the word that has been planted in our hearts, that we do not forget what God has been speaking to you this week about, that we focus in on the Lord this morning, that we set aside any distractions, anything that um, could keep us from focusing in on God this morning. I just want to encourage you to keep your focus on the Lord this morning. Have the Holy Spirit do something in your heart where you can hear what He is trying to say. Because church, I really believe that in this time God is speaking. He has much to say and we need to hear what He has to say. So let's pray this morning. We're going to go into worship with David again and um, just enjoy the presence of the Lord in your homes this morning. Father, we thank you so much. We offer ourselves to you this morning knowing that, God, we come together not just because uh, it's habitual or it's because something we, we need to do. Oh, I need to check the box that I went to church this morning. But we come together, God, because we want to grow closer to you. We want to give you praise. We want to give you worship and honor. And Lord, more importantly, we want to hear from you because God, you are speaking to us and you are speaking to the church and those who are following you, God, all over, Lord, your word is true. So I pray that uh, this morning, those of us who have heard from you even this week, I pray that your word and our worship would resonate in our hearts this morning and that you would hear um, the praises of your people. We offer ourselves to you today, Lord. We know that when your word says, how can we stay pure? It's by focusing on your word. It's by hearing your voice. And Lord, I just pray that there would just be an overwhelming sense of your presence, God, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi guys. Good morning, everybody. Um, as we get started here, um, I was thinking actually this morning. You know, like like Kara said, it's it's easy to get distracted when we're doing this kind of church, um, and it's almost like it takes more it takes more of a discipline to really enter in. We were talking in our small group last week about. Um, how important it is for us to stay connected to the Spirit and just to be in the presence of God and, and not get so wrapped up in this digital thing that we're doing that we just sort of, we can lose that connection super easily and get distracted. So this morning as we do worship, I just want to ask you to do something with me. Why don't you just, let's pause our comments this morning as we worship. Let, don't, don't type anything. Just take a time, you know, with the Lord and let's, let's actually engage ourselves and try to connect with His Spirit because He really... He wants to pour out on us this morning, and we need that connection. It's so vital right now. And I don't care if you're in your apartment, I want you to sing with me, okay? Best you can. Here we go. You are so good to me. You heal my broken heart. You are my Father in heaven. Sing it again. You are so good to me. You heal my broken heart. You are my Father in heaven And you are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song Yes, you are You are beautiful, my sweet, sweet song And I'll sing again Just engage your heart You are my soul, 
deeper still as you call. Deeper still as you call. Yeah. Deeper still into love. Love, love, you're the good, good fun. To you are. To you are. To you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. Who I am, who I am, sing perfect one more time. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, Jesus, you're perfect in all of your ways. So perfect.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You can engage your compliments. Or your, your compliments for Jesus right now. Turn your, uh, your typing back on, but give God the glory, all right? Give God the glory right now in your text. Amen. Thank you, David. So great to have every single one of you with us here this morning, uh, worshiping the Lord, uh, fostering and engaging as much community as we possibly can as the people of God. So thank you. If this is your first time uh, with us here at Uptown Church, we just want to extend a special welcome to you uh, and just thank you for being here, uh, joining in with us. Uh, our Family, our Uptown Church family would love to be able to reach out to you. So if you would just make yourself known, uh, state your name, where you're watching from, saying that you're a first-time guest, and then I know that our Uptown Church uh, family would love to just be able to welcome you uh, and make you feel right at home this morning. Uh, turn your attention to the screen, and uh, for the next few minutes, uh, Scott is here with a special guest to give us some of our church announcements. Church Storm of the Hedgehog edition. First off, everybody please take a moment to greet each other. Hi Stormy, how's it going? You having a good night? Everybody greet each other right now. It's not really nighttime too, it's Sunday morning, you just can't tell. What's that? You want some food? Sorry, I don't have any for you right now. Alright, I think they're done. All right, so at Uptown Church, we love interaction during our Facebook services, so hit those like buttons, use those emojis, and comment abundantly. So we have Zoom groups that are happening Tuesdays at 6.30. To join a Zoom group, all you have to do is sign up for the church directory. The link to that will be in the comments at uptowncub.org slash directory. Also, we have weekly devotionals Thursdays on Zoom at 6.30 with Pastor Jeremy. The ID for that is 638-955-1672. And the password is Uptown. You can use that same login info to attend a post-service coffee right after the service today. Where you can bring your own coffee, or not, or your own snacks. Stormy is going to have some food. Actually, you want some food? No? Yeah. She's having the food. So, and finally, you can give your tithe or financial gift to Uptown Church by texting a dollar amount to 84321 or through our website at uptowncub.org slash giving. Thank you, Scott, for those announcements. It was great to see Stormy the Hedgehog uh, making an appearance as well. Um, if you are wanting to get a little bit more engaged in the life of Uptown Church, uh, what you can do is you can follow the link that you see on the screen. Uh, and it's just a, a page on our website where you can just put your name and your email address and that's going to allow us to connect with you, uh, let you know what's happening here at the church. And uh, myself personally, uh, as the pastor, I would like to reach out to you and welcome you here. So especially if this is your first, second or third time and you haven't yet uh, connected in this way, we would love for you to follow the link. It's on the screen. It'll also be in the comment section of the uh, Facebook page uh, as well. Uh, I want to personally invite our church, I've been talking about this for the last few weeks and hopefully you're uh, marking it on the calendar, that uh, the month of August for us as a church is a, a month where we're putting an emphasis on prayer and fasting. Uh, we are facing uh, this pandemic, we are facing issues of racial injustice, we're trying to figure out what we are going to do as a church in terms of regathering and what that's going to look like, and we need to spend some time interceding and seeking the Lord uh, in these areas. Um, especially when it comes to uh, the challenges that we're facing today in the world, uh, we need to balance our uh, social engagement with spiritual fervor. 
We cannot be people, as followers of Jesus, we cannot just only be socially engaged. And as followers of Jesus, we cannot only just be spiritually fervent as well. And we tend to lean one side or the other. But here at Uptown Church, what we are trying to stay focused on is being a people that are spiritually fervent, interceding, seeking the Lord, fasting about all of these issues. We know that racism and a lot of the problems that we face today are spiritual powers and principalities that need to be torn down through intercession. Uh, these are not just social problems, but we also have to be so, uh, socially engaged. We have to confront the systems. We have to confront the structures that are creating problems uh, and challenges and creating uh, an unfair, uh, unequitable system in our world. So we have to be doing both. Uh, we cannot let our guard down. We must be spiritually fervent and we must be socially engaged. So I want to encourage you as a church, stay socially engaged. But in the month of August, I'm also asking for us to spend time doing prayer and fasting, and we're doing that on Thursdays. Every Thursday in the month of August, we as a church are going to fast and pray. And I know that some of us have medical con conditions, uh, things that are going to keep us from uh, fully participating with fasting food. I want to encourage you to find creative ways that you can fast something uh, for the day, but for the most part, we are just encouraging everyone in our church to engage Thursdays in August in prayer and fasting. We want to be spiritually fervent while also being socially engaged. Uh, we postponed our community cookout that was supposed to happen yesterday with the rising cases of coronavirus and uh, the travel quarantines that are happening. We just felt that it was best to, uh, to take that path and we just want to keep everybody in tune. Hopefully uh, we can start to see a, a decrease and we'll start going the other direction and then we want to be able to host and facilitate another community cookout soon in the park. Uh, stay tuned for information on that. And don't forget that after the service today, I will be facilitating communion on Zoom. So part of our post-service coffee time on Zoom will be a time for us as a church to take communion together. So come, bring your elements, and please engage with us on Zoom for um, communion today. I do also want to mention and thank the Lord that Sharon Burney is home from the hospital. She was in the hospital for 36 days, uh, and she is home recovering, so we want to praise God for his healing power and work in her. Uh, Roger and Jeannie have been doing such a good job of helping to make sure that she is being taken care of by her church family. So if you can help with providing meals or uh, things to help her and Shakira out, would you reach out to Roger and Jeannie? Uh, I'm sure that they're watching. They can make themselves known. Uh, they have all the info in terms of like meal plans, things along those lines. And we as a church want to make sure that we're supporting Sharon and Shakira during these times. Uh, we are inviting everyone to be sending in their videos and their photos so that we can foster a sense of community. I think it's extremely important for us as a church to see one another in any way that we possibly can. We cannot be physically in the same room, so to be able to at least see each other on the screen, to hear our voices, it can be so encouraging for the rest of us. So uh, right now we have a very short clip of our facilities team. They got together uh, this past week and they just wanted to say hi, so just take a quick look at the screen. Hello, Uptown Church, from all of us. Hey, Hi. Go drink coffee. Get outside. And you'll also see on the screen a photo. They got together to play croquet, so you'll see a picture of them um, getting together in the park to play croquet. So we just, uh, in any way that we as a church can get together safely uh, and facilitate connection and being the body of Christ together, so that I think that's just a really great uh, thing to see. Uh, a, a sad thing for us as a church, but a happy thing uh, for the Moore family is um, if you know Carolyn, Hannah, and Chloe, uh, they left this week for Las Vegas. Uh, God has provided an opportunity for them to move out to Nevada, and we are so happy for them, and we are so glad that God has provided this new opportunity for them and their family, but we as a church are going to miss them. So Karen and I and Cecilia were able to go over on the day that they were moving to pray with them and bless them on their way out. It is such a sad day for us as we are uh, not going to be able to be with them personally anymore, but would you keep them in your prayers? I'm sure they're watching online right now. Would you send out like comments, uh, a blessing to them? Would you encourage them uh, as they're taking this next step uh, in their family's life journey. Uh, there's a second picture here of Cecilia with um, just Hannah and Chloe as well, and we just love them, and we are so glad that they've been able to be part of our church. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to see them at some point here 
um, in the future. This morning we are starting a new sermon series and we've entitled it Bodybuilders. Um, Bodybuilders because Paul writes about the fivefold ministry in Ephesians chapter 4 stating that God has instituted these ministry roles uh, to equip the life of the church, to deepen our knowledge of God, to build unity in the body, to mature us, and to unleash the fullness of Christ in us uh, and in his church. All of us are given gifts in these areas, uh, and I want to invite you uh, during this sermon series over the next uh, five weeks to go to fivefoldministry.com. You're going to see that link on the screen. Uh, screen and it's a 10 minute test. They have a short test and they have a long test. I would say do the longer test. It's only 45 questions and it's just a way to begin to gauge where we might be gifted at. It's free and it only takes 10 minutes of your time. Uh, I did the test myself and my results I'm putting on to the screen. Uh, you'll see that out of the five that I scored the highest in teacher with apostle uh, right below it. Those are like my top two uh, gift sets, evangelist and prophet right underneath that, and pastor shepherd uh, at the bottom. And then as you take the test, you can read about what each one states or says uh, and um, what it means in terms of the wiring that God has put in you. So we are going to be going through each one of these uh, ministry um, uh, roles uh, each, each Sunday through the month of August. And uh, my prayer is that God will teach us more about what uh, the body of Christ is to be about, how he is wanting the body of Christ to be led uh, and to be used in the world today. So I am very happy to be able to introduce Jeff Hubing, who is here to preach uh, this Sunday morning. Uh, not only is Jeff going to preach about the, uh, the role of the apostle, he is one of the people in my life that I see as a true modern day uh, apostle. He is in charge of Cross Culture Church, which is a movement of house churches around the Chicago area. Um, he uh, taught at the Fire School of Ministry, and um, he's just a wonderful communicator, wonderful teacher. I love him and his family. He's been with us before. I've known him for a really long time. So would you join me in welcoming Jeff as he comes to share God's word with us today? Good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you, and uh, thanks so much to Jeremy for the invitation. Uh, it's my joy, really, to be with you guys today, to be able to talk to you about Ephesians 4, um, the fivefold ministry, and, uh, you know, I, I realize that people have a lot of different views about fivefold ministry, and if you've kind of been in the Christian camp or in, in charismatic circles, especially for some time, you, you probably have maybe have heard conversations about this, discussions, and uh, I'm perfectly aware today that there are some who think that this conversation is just on, on the front end unnecessary because such people as apostles and prophets don't exist anymore. I am going to leave those debates for Jeremy. Uh, you know, I, I, I promised him just this morning before I started that I would try not to say anything. It wouldn't take him longer than six months to correct so uh, I'm going to leave a lot of the, those kinds of conversations for you know, your future um, connecting. My goal today is to orient you to Paul's mindset in Ephesians 4, to introduce you to his understanding of the reality of the body of Jesus and how it is meant to develop and grow and why. Uh, and you know, just hopefully try, try to get inside the mind of the Apostle Paul and then spend a little time discussing what I think he would uh, want us to understand about apostles. So uh, in, in the time that we have, and you have to forgive me, I'm going to put a little clock here. And, and here's why. I usually teach a 10-week class on this subject. And I was given 30 minutes. So we're going to have to, you know, there's going to have to be just a little bit of expediting of this message this morning. Um, but I, I'm confident that you guys are going to enjoy unpacking it. So let me start with prayer. Father, thank you for the Word of God. It's our anchor and our mooring and our ground. And today I pray that you would open it to the people of God, that we, might, that we would be nourished, that we would, be, we would be fed. Our minds would be transformed and renewed. So come, Holy Spirit, breathe and speak and build the body in true fashion today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, Ephesians 4. 
Without Ephesians 4, we might not be talking about anything called fivefold ministry. It is the only passage in the New Testament where this specific combination of five people groups are mentioned in connection with the mission of building the body of Jesus. Um, but like several other things that we believe about as, as Christians, just because it's only there once, of course, doesn't mean it, it is insignificant. I think it's there for a reason, and it has to do with Paul's mentality in writing Ephesians. You might be familiar with the letter of Ephesians. It has two main sections. The first one, chapters 1 through 3, essentially describe uh, what Paul refers to in Ephesians 3.11 as God's eternal purpose. It's, it's like a, a big picture view of how Paul understands the gospel, both with, with respect to human reconciliation to God, which occupies a chunk of uh, Ephesians chapter 2, but also reconciliation to one another, right? The, the whole, he himself is our peace in Ephesians 2.14, which refers to ethnic distinction and the destruction of hatred and enmity, the unifying of God's people into one new humanity through the gospel, and which leads into a conversation of Paul's own apostolic work in Ephesians 3. So the, it, chapters 1 through 3 are descriptive. They're what I like to call indicative, which means they, they point out, they indicate, they describe reality as Paul sees it with respect to the gospel and its overarching purposes. Paul turns a corner in chapter 4, and he begins to address the practical implications of what he's just described. So, in other words, if chapters 1 through 3 are true, then what? And that's what chapter 4 begins to describe. Uh, the second major part of the letter deals with giving practical expression to a heavenly and eternal reality. And, and, and it, it, it kind of generates now, you know, kind of very specific instructions that come later. Uh, toward the end of chapter 5 and into chapter 6, but chapter 4 is like, okay, I've just described the reality in which we are immersed through the gospel. Now, here's what you need to understand. And the chapter begins um, with an exhortation to walk in a manner that is worthy of the gospel, worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Now, that's not a personal issue. Uh, the word you... In, in chapter 4, verse 1, is plural. Walk worthy of the calling you all have, been, have received. In other words, your gospel calling, your, your kingdom calling. How do you do that? Well, in order to walk worthy, two fundamental realities must mark God's people. Number one is unity. The first six verses emphasize the oneness of the gospel, of the Lord, of the body, of the baptism. These are the realities that unify and that are consistent across the board. So you got several verses there that say you must be one. But in verse 7, again, Paul says it's not just unity, it's also diversity. So if you're reading, you can see in verse one, uh, verse uh, 4, he says there's one body, you know, one hope, one Lord, etc. The word one is emphasized. But in verse 7, he switches and he says now... To each one, grace has been given. So there, there's a shift in verse 7 to be alert to the fact that just because there's unity, it does not mean that we must have uniformity. Uniformity means everybody has to do the same thing in the same way all the time. <laughs> That's not the kingdom. It's not the body of Jesus. No, uniformity is, is the imposition of human uh, authority and typically a kind of a religiosity that wants everybody to look like me. That doesn't get us anywhere. We need unity, yes. But unity only makes sense when there's also the corresponding value of diversity. Diversity is marked not just by distinction, but by spirit birth distinction. We're not just talking about people doing what they want to do because it's interesting to them or because they have a better idea. We're talking about the fact that according, verse 7 says according to the measure of the gift of the Messiah, according to Christ's gift, there is diversity. According to the gift of Jesus, there is grace given to each person, and it's distinct, and it's marked okay, by, by a heavenly origin that's so significant. 
We're not just trying to talk about diversity so just so that we can have people that do different things and we can, you know, oh wow, that's so different. You know, what, what we want is God to breathe the diversity, just like he breathes the unity. It's the same God that stands behind the unity and the diversity. So as you're working your way through verses 8 through 11, you realize a little bit of an interesting conversation about ascending and descending and then a quote from Psalm 68 that seems to be uh, adjusted a little bit by Paul to make reference to instead of, if you read Psalm 68, uh, ver verse 18, it's the, God receives gifts. But Paul expresses it here in verse 8 as he gave gifts to people when Christ ascended. There's a reason for that. Because, uh, and the reason is that the gifts that are received and the gifts that are given are the same. They're people. So he, as you're reading through that, you see he ascended, he, he, led host cap, he led a host of captives when he ascended on high, and then he turned around and gave them right back. It's Paul's mentality about salvation, even his own salvation, is almost like he was captured by Jesus. Like, like, a, uh, like a prisoner of war. It's like Jesus conquered him. And then he brought him into the reality of fellowship, and then he turned around and sent him out. That's where we get the language of apostles, by the way. So I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a second. But the logic of Paul's argument says unity, diversity. The diversity is not generated simply by human creativity. It's generated by divine intention. Right? It's God's idea, the diversity. And it's God's idea, as a result, that has to, right, ground and, and locate the identity of Christ's body. We are not at liberty to build the church how we want. Let me just sit on that point for a minute. The church is the body of Jesus Christ. It is not a human organization that we have the freedom to develop in the way that suits us. The body of Jesus should be developed according to the mind of Jesus. And this is Paul's point. God has a way of building, right? And that way includes the distribution of apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Let's, let's look at the language in verse 11. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And as you continue to read the paragraph, you, you understand building up means maturity, building up means growth, building up means mobilization, right? The body is not mature, the body does not function as Jesus intended it to until, verse 16 says, each part is working properly, making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In the end, the ministry of the five groups of people mentioned in verse 11 is to mobilize the rest of the parts of the body to build themselves up. Now that's a, a hugely different mentality that many people have about leadership today. Many people think the job of leaders is to do the work. And what they're supposed to do is collect people to be underneath them. You know, and, and people measure their success in leadership by how many people they have underneath their, their authority. Paul's mentality is quite different. For him, the role of leadership in these five-fold groups is to mobilize the body so that they themselves can work and they themselves can build. It, it's a totally different mindset. It's a mindset of restoration and releasing rather than a mindset of attracting and submitting other people to your, you know, your office or whatever you want to call it. So I'll, I'll come back to that again in a minute. But, th but think about the, the language of Paul. He gave... Uh, if you have a, a translation of the scriptures that reads slightly different in verse 11, I want to explain it just for a second. Uh, a number of translations write this in such a way that it says, He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be. Now, I just I want to make a comment. The language, the words, some to be, they're not in the text. Uh, the text is far more simple and straightforward. The text says he gave the apostles. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. It's very straightforward. Why does that matter, Jeff? You know, why, why are you going into detail about grammar and whatnot? Here's why. 
Because I don't want you to misunderstand Paul's logic here. I want you to be very clear that the gifts that are given in verse 8 are the groups of people that are mentioned in verse 11. Okay, when it says he ascended on high, he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to people. Verse 11, he gave, these are the gifts, the gifts of the people. Now for us, that's a little weird because we're used to thinking in terms of 1 Corinthians 12, maybe Romans 12, where the, the gifts are more like manifestations or expressions or something like that. But it, and, and again, this is not to deny the reality of that. It's absolutely true that in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans 12, Paul uses the language of gifts, charismata, to refer to these kind of expressions or spiritual capacities that people are given by the Spirit. In Ephesians 4, it's not quite the same. Here, the word for gifts is different. It's domata, coming from Psalm 68. And the gifts themselves are different. They're not just abilities, and they're not just capacities. They're actually human beings. And that's important. It's important to Paul's mentality. It's important to the strategy given by Jesus to build the church. This isn't just something abstract. This is very gritty. This is very human. This is very, like, Flesh and blood, these gifts, these people themselves are necessary. Okay, So think about it. He gave, and again, the five groups of people. Again, some people like to talk about offices. I understand that, and maybe there's a conversation about that at another point. But here, Paul isn't talking about offices. He's just talking about people recognized according to their spiritually kind of mapped out identity. He, Paul's an apostle. Others in the New Testament are called apostles uh, and, and prophets and evangelists. Um, so I want you to think about it as just, man, the people themselves are, are the fruit of Jesus' ascension. Like, his ascension captures people and then turns around and repurposes them into service for the kingdom of God. And the three things he says are necessary— they, they equip the saints, and then for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Jesus Christ. For the, equipping the saints, what does that word mean? It means something like this, restore, mend, and even align. In one medical handbook in Paul's time, it was referred to what has to happen to a broken bone. It has to be mended and aligned. So I think of Paul's language... What do, what do these five groups of people do? They have to align the saints. They have to like, help them to be restored in the family of God, in the body of Jesus, to find their place and line them up with the vision of the gospel that Paul's just explained in chapters 1 through 3. So the saints, the holy ones, the people of God, they've got to be aligned, they have to be mended, restored, and they have to be made capable of doing the work that he talked about in verses 15 and 16. For the work of ministry, now that could apply to the saints or it could apply still to the five groups. There are different schools of thought on that. Either way, ministry for Paul is typically a way of speaking either of the work of the gospel in his apostolic sense or the serving of the, of the body in, in very practical ways. The Greek word diakonia is where we get our term deacon. Well, with the emphasis on ministry being serving, contributing to the needs of others, and in some cases for Paul, uh, the ministry of the gospel in a more apostolic general sense, announcing, proclaiming, and body. And then finally, building up the body of the Messiah, the body of Christ. This is the construction work um, to which every believer is called to build. Everyone in the kingdom should be a builder. Now, there are men like Paul, which I'll come back to a little bit later, who are more like architect level. And then there are more, you know, others of us who are like, just give me a brick and tell me where to put it. It's good. You know, some of us have an inkling that, yeah, there is a bigger picture out there, but I, I you know, it's, it's kind of beyond me. So just plug me in. Let me, let me do my job. Others of us, we can't really sit still if we're not thinking about the bigger picture and, and the ultimate expression of the project. That's fine. And that's absolutely right. That's as it should be. If if we have a bunch of people that are just concerned with big picture stuff but just can't get in there and do it, we're going to have a problem. And if we have people that are just fixated on, let me, I, all I do is I nail things, you know, like, then everything's going to, you know, I got a hammer, everything's going to start looking like a nail to me. You know, we need both. We need people who can step back and say, all right, hang on. We don't need a closet there, right? That's where the front door goes. 
oh, okay. You know, and then, and then we need others who like have the capacity to get in there and cut the hole in the wall and put the frame in and install the, the hardware and everything else. Like, so it is by design that people have bo different points of departure, different points of emphasis, different points of focus in terms of who they are. That has to be the way. Jesus uh, needs a body that it needs to get built over time. And that's the expression that Paul's looking for. This vision of, of Christ in you, you know, that, which Paul calls the one part of the mystery of the gospel, Christ in you, not you as a single person, but you, plural again, that, that's the mystery, is Christ in you. How, how is Christ formed in us? Well, Paul's answer is, you need these five groups of people because they've got to align, mend, and restore the body, make them ready, and then you need the body itself to start working, building, contributing. Um, nowhere in the New Testament is the call for individual believers to sit on a bench, you know, put, put some money in a plate, and applaud the, the pastor after he's done speaking. I mean, listen, I, most pastors appreciate that applause. But no, I'm, I, what I'm saying is that, no, the call of the New Testament is for people to build. If you're in the body of Jesus, you're a builder. You're destined to build. Now, I'm not saying what or how. That's part of the discovery process. But the, but the body's got to build itself up because our destiny is to be a permanent and eternal dwelling place for the Lord, right? Ephesians 2.20. Uh, that, that's what we are being built into, right? So the logic of Ephesians 4 works like that. And after you get done with verse 16, you start to turn the corner to very practical exhortation. How, all right, back to the idea of walking worthy, right? That was the, that was the theme, the, the thunder note in chapter 4 at the very beginning. Verse 17, he picks up on it again. Now, no longer walk according to the way you used to. In other words, let's flesh this out. What does it look like to be Jesus' body in the world? And there's conversations about honesty and truth. And there's conversations about... Uh, mercy and compassion and patience. And then there's conversations in chapter 5 about family, like spouses and kids. And there's conversation in chapter 6 even about things like spiritual battle. Right? So the practical expressions come out of the big picture strategy. And you don't want one without the other. You, you want the both and of the apostolic imperative, if you will. Right? So we had the indicative, 1 through 3. This is how it is. This is the reality. This is the master plan, the eternal, pur eternal purpose. And then you have the indicative in four through six. All right, here's what you do as a result of what's true. So that's our introduction to Ephesians 4. Verse 11, we said five groups of people. My job this morning in the time that remains is to kind of describe what is Paul's mentality? What does he mean by the apostles? Okay. Um, apostleship for Paul is obviously a crucial concept. For us today, there's a lot of confusion around that. You know, there, there's some obviously that think oh, there was only 12 apostles or maybe 13 if you count Paul and then there aren't any more or talk about apostles being, well, you can't be an apostle because apostles wrote the Bible so you can't, there's no new revelation. So we can't, a lot of debate. I'm going to leave that to the side. I want to think Paul's thoughts. What does he mean by the apostles? And why does he start there? If you've ever read Paul's letters, you know he considers apostles, along with prophets, to be the foundation of the body of Jesus Christ, the foundation of the house of God. Chapter 2 of Ephesians, he, he says that again. The apostles and prophets are, found, are the foundation. Why? What is the big deal with apostles? Well, Paul, as a man... Um, has an identity that was radically transformed by an encounter with Jesus. Through that encounter, he came to understand himself as an apostle. The term simply means, usually, messenger, in a generic sense. Somebody who is sent in order to convey a message to another person on behalf of the sender. One of the ways that Judaism described this uh, in, in in Aramaic, is, is through a term that meant like a, an envoy or a proxy. A proxy, like in a legal sense, is someone who stands in your place and is authorized to conduct business on your behalf. It's like if you buy a house or sell a house and you don't want to go to the closing, your lawyer can go for you and serve as your proxy. 
You know, you sign a paper that says they're representing you in this matter and they are, it's as if you're there, but you, you know, you're executing your function through your lawyer. They are your personal representative. They're authorized on your behalf to execute that business. Uh, the term apostle has this implication. It's somebody who's sent on behalf of another person to represent them. Okay? Um, the Jewish uh, rabbis had a saying. Okay? The one sent is as the sender. In other words, they, if, 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 if uh, you know, we could think about it something like that. If Mayor Lightfoot sent somebody to your house today, that, that person represents the mayor. It's as if the mayor is coming. And that person is speaking on her behalf, authorized by her, executes her wishes. That person would be like a messenger and apostle of, of Mayor Lightfoot, right? So when, when New Testament authors use this term, they are using it in the sense of someone who is sent. So the emphasis on the origin of the person, sent. It's not really on the activity. And that's the difference between the apostles and the other four groups. The other four groups are named after kind of what they do. Prophets, what do they do? Well, they prophesy. Evangelists, what do evangelists? Well, they, they evangelize. What, what do teachers do? Well, they teach. What about pastors, shepherds? Well, they shepherd. They, what do apostles do? Well, they don't apostle. <laughs> they are apostles. They are sent. So the whole point of an apostle is to point you back to the origin. Right? The whole mentality of an apostle is to point you back to the one who sent them. It's a very Jesus-centered mindset that apostles have. The language in the New Testament comes from Jesus. He, he seems to be the first to use this terminology in Luke 6. He calls his 12, who are many times just called disciples, but in Luke 6 they are actually called apostles. Um, called them to be apostles. It comes uh, from Jesus' own mentality of preparing a group of men, in this case, uh, later on, there are some women in the New Testament that seem to have apostolic identity. But in this case, these 12 men who, who are called to be apostles, in other words, are called to represent him, uh, to, to execute responsibilities on his behalf. There are at least eight other people in the New Testament who are named as apostles. Some people think that's it. You know, there's the 12, and maybe Paul functions as a, you know, a kind of oddball 13th apostle, because he says, uh, you know, finally to me, Christ was revealed in 1 Corinthians 15. But uh, it seems fairly clear that's not how Paul thinks. Uh, I'm going to tell you the other apostles named in the New Testament outside of the 12. There's Paul, of course. Barnabas is called an apostle in Acts 14 and 1 Corinthians 9. Andronicus and Junia are referred to as apostles in Romans 16.7. James, the brother of the Lord, is called an apostle in Galatians 1.19. Timothy and Sil Silvanus or Silas are referred to as apostles in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2, 6. And Apollos is referred to as an apostle in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 6 and 9. So if you think about it, we, there are more apostles named in the New Testament than any other of the five groups. Okay, with Very few prophets named. I think there's three, maybe two. Uh, there's one evangelist who's given a name, Philip. Uh, there's, I'm not sure if there are any teachers specifically named. There are zero pastors named. Shepherds, sorry for the shepherds out there. Zero shepherds named in the New Testament outside of the Lord Jesus, the chief shepherd. So, but all that to say, apostles in my view are not limited to the 12. They're not limited to the 12 plus Paul. They are a category of people. And for Paul, especially connected to the ascension of Jesus, right? It's the ascension of and then he gave. So out of his authority as exalted king, he gives the apostles. And their work is envisioned as ongoing until the body builds itself up to maturity. Now, if you're one of those who suggests the body is fully mature, then maybe we have no more need for apostles. I'm not one of those people. So you have all these people who are named apostles. Uh, they are sent. And they are given specific work that has to do with the construction the founding, the mobilizing of Christ's body. So what is an apostle? I want to give you four phrases that I feel will help just give you a mindset based on the mentality, of, especially of Paul, because he writes the most about it, um, of what an apostle is. Okay, Number one, an apostle is a personal agent of Jesus Christ. Personal agent. Meaning, again, the identity of the apostle is to point back to the one who sends. The apostle is in a personal 
relationship with Jesus. And in general, their responsibility is to represent him in whatever function they are called to undertake. Right? So it's not a description, apostle is not a description of function first, it's a description of relationship. It's a description of origin and then personal advocacy. We talk a lot, we talk a lot about advocates these days, advocating for this and that and the other thing. An apostle advocates for Jesus. <laughs> he advocates for Jesus and his burdens. Okay? He is a kind of manifestation of Jesus Christ. I don't mean this in a heretical way. An apostle is not Jesus. But he is a kind of reflection of Jesus. He is a kind of expression in an ideal world. Okay, I'm, I'm not talking about, well, I, let me just stick with the text here. Right? It's, he, is, he is a sent one. And in, in an ideal sense, he is sent simply to speak, act, and work on behalf of Jesus and, and represent his interests. He's an agent because there is a mission involved. And so you could use advocate because you're representative. I like agent because it suggests like there's, there's a, you know, there is a motive. The motive is generated by Christ, but there's still a motive. There's still a mission. And so the apostle is working unto the completion of that mission. So personal agent of Jesus Christ. It's very important to Paul. Second phrase. An apostle is a steward of the gospel. A steward of the gospel. What do I mean by steward? A steward is someone who is entrusted with a responsibility, with something he or she does not own, but is called to manage. It's called to care for, called to protect, called to preserve, called to um, use in order to accomplish the, the, the purposes of the one who does own it. Stewardship is a very important principle in God's kingdom. Jesus told parables about this. If you remember the one about the talents, it's maybe one of the most popular parables about stewardship. Stewards are people who receive something that doesn't originate with them, but then they, they manage it. They care for it in a way that seeks to honor the one that gave it to them. Paul is a steward of the gospel. Apostles are stewards. They're entrusted with the gospel. And that means they have a sense of ownership of it. Not, not that it comes from them, not that they can control it, but they know the one to whom that gospel belongs and they're operating on behalf of him. So stewardship implies, as I read it, three subparts. Number one, a comprehension of the gospel and insight into its mysteries. You read Paul long enough, you're going to, come across passages that refer to him having insight into the mystery of the gospel. In fact, uh, Ephesians 3, verse 3, because of revelation, that is God opening up the realities of the gospel to Paul, he had insight, he understands mysteries, he lists a number of mysteries in his letters, including Jesus Christ himself, Colossians 2, uh, Christ in you, uh, the, the, the unity of the body, Ephesians 3, uh, Gentiles and Jews, uh, joint heirs in Christ, he refers to the resurrection as a mystery in 1 Corinthians 15. He refers to the restoration and salvation of Israel as a mystery in Romans 11. There are mysteries and apostles are stewards of those mysteries. They have to understand the gospel. Right? It is their burden. It is like the burning passion of their lives to know the gospel and to understand it beyond comparison. Just that they want to dig into it. They want to swim around in it. They want their whole life and their mentality to be governed by it. Apostle and gospel are inextricably linked. You cannot, you cannot have apostle without gospel, and you can really not have gospel going forth without apostles, at least not in the way that Jesus intends. Comprehension. Number two, proclamation. Apostles proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. They just cannot not do that. Right? 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Paul says, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. <laughs> Like some people may, you know, may have the option to preach the gospel. Some people may have opportunity. Paul says, I cannot not do it. it. Woe to me. In other words, that I would fall under judgment like Chorazin and Bethsaida, right? That Jesus pronounces woes over in the gospels. Woe to me if I'm not doing that. Part of the stewardship is the proclamation. 
Part of the stewardship is the announcement that Jesus is king or Jesus is Lord and the extrapolation of the implications of that. It's, it's an apostolic burden that they just cannot run from. Some people can run from that. You're, you're a teacher. You know, your, your primary gift is to unfold and unpack. You're like, proclamation, well, you know, I can take that or leave it. You know, pastors, man, let me, let me just wrap my arms around you, man. Let me, let's just spend some time. I want, let me get inside there, you know, in your heart. Let me feel what you feel. You know, proclamation, ah. Uh, no, but just come and sit on the couch. Let's just talk. <laughs> Apostle cannot not proclaim. It's just, it's DNA, guys. It's identity. And I'm not talking about works righteousness. I'm not talking about earning your relationship with God. I'm saying God forms apostles in a certain way that they cannot not do it. It's just, it's just who they are. And they honor the Lord by proclaiming the message of truth. Number three, apostles protect and defend the gospel. That's why you see Paul like consistently aware of false teaching, false brothers, false apostles. It's like, bro, do you have some kind of complex? No, it's an apostolic responsibility to steward the purity and integrity of the message. So that's why you have Galatians. That's why you have 2 Corinthians. That's why you have a, an, an apostolic man contending you know, for the reality and the truth of what has been taught, what has been announced, and what has been deposited. The gospel is a trust. It can't be compromised, distorted, abbreviated, or substituted. Like th these, these are foundational realities for apostles. They're not going to be content if you just have a part of the gospel. They're like, ah, it's okay. You know, they got the. the no, apostles, man, no, look, I did not hold anything back from you, right? Acts 20. I poured the full everything. I, I pulled it, I poured it out in front of you. That's, that's what I did. I didn't hold anything back. I laid it all out there for you. Whether you understood it or not, I laid it out there for you. I, you can't hold me responsible for you not knowing something. That's apostolic burden. That's a stewardship. That's, that's taking this precious trust, <laughs> the gospel, the hope of the world, and saying it's, it's going to define me. Gospel and apostle, they're just, yeah, they're intertwined. So a personal agent, steward of the gospel. Third phrase is this, a kingdom pioneer. I like the language of pioneer. Most of us can relate to that. If we've studied American history, it means plunging into undeveloped territory. I understand there's some colonial implications to this and mistreatment of indigenous peoples. Don't go there with my analogy. I'm just saying a pioneer is someone who enters territory that to them appears virgin, un never exposed to their presence or to their burden or to their message. In this case, Apostles are well known in the New Testament for plunging into territory that's never encountered the living God or has no representation in terms of the reality of God's kingdom uh, or the Son, Jesus Christ. This is especially obvious in Paul, Romans 15, 20, where he says, I make it my ambition to preach Christ where he has not been named. It's an apostolic burden to break new ground on behalf of the kingdom which is the loving rule of Jesus, to which he has a right by virtue of his blood. Okay, Psalm 2. When God says, I have installed my king, my son, right? The nations are his inheritance. There's nothing out here that doesn't belong to Jesus. That's good news, by the way. Psalm 24. The earth is Yahweh's and everything in it. I used to teach ministry school students. I used to tell them, listen, doesn't matter where God sends you, you're always on home court. Okay, there's nowhere you can go on this planet that doesn't belong to the Lord by right. Apostles are people who want to say, the kingdom is exerting a claim over this territory. Again, not in an imperialist, humanist, uh, fleshly way. In a profoundly real way, saying there is a God who created heaven and earth for a purpose and for his glory, and you, you know, you, you peoples of Greece, you, you peoples of Northern Italy, you peoples of the jungles of Thailand, you peoples of Australia, you are made for him. And I've come to reveal him to you so that you can be reconciled to him and so that your reconciliation can generate joy, sweet fellowship, true justice, real life that will never end. He's a kingdom pioneer. I'm telling you. 
means geographical expansion. It also means hardships and suffering. You don't read about a pioneer who's like, yeah, it was cool. You know, we just kayaked down the lake and stayed at a five-star resort. No, there aren't any resorts. There aren't any kayaks. You had to build everything from scratch. Apostles build foundations, guys. They're not just like elected to lead you know, existing companies. They don't do that. It's not their heart. Might they come in and, and leave an impact and, and rearrange something? For sure. But they're not going to probably be content to stay there. Think Romans. Paul's never visited Rome. But he writes this letter and says, I have something to, to give you. So I'm telling you this because I'm going to visit. But when I come to visit, I'm not staying. I'm going to Spain. If you guys can help me out, maybe a translator, maybe some funds to get, you know. So apostle, uh, apostolic mindset has to do with this. And so there's going to be hardships. There's going to be, you know, this difficulties, opposition, persecution, both demonic and human. Like if, if you're not on board for that, then apostleship is not for you. It's, it's going to be a real part of the ballgame. Little things, big things. Frustrations with your plumbing and people who threw, threw rocks through your windows. Like just, it's, it's all a part of it. Apostles have to be so, like, I mean, the sandpaper has to come out. Because they have to represent Jesus personally. It's not just about a ministry function or performance. They are a walking representation of Jesus. So they're going to have to be scrubbed. They're going to be have to, they're going to have to be sanded down by hardship, by frustration, by weakness, Paul says. But the great thing is that in all of that power, is supplied. His, Paul says, this, you know, his power is perfected in my weakness. You're not talking about, he's not, he's not a novice now. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 11, he lists off all the ways he's been weak. All his sufferings, his hardships, you know, persecuted in the city and in the country, a night and day in, in the deep. Like, why? Because of meekness, because of humility, because of the recognition that power can't come from me. And that's the temptation for apostle, right? I mean, wow, I'm a personal representative of Jesus. You get puffy. You think to yourself, oh, I got power, I got authority. All the while Jesus is saying, excuse me, I'm the one with the power, I'm the one with authority. You represent me. Don't get it twisted. Don't call on me to back you. No, you're there. I'm sorry. Don't, don't call on me to do your will. You're there to do mine. So there's going to be difficulty. What, what are apostles doing? They're establishing outposts of the kingdom outposts colonies in the best sense of that word right colonies that represent absolute truth justice freedom liberation from the darkness and the swirl and the confusion that exists in human cultures okay the philippians 3:20 your our citizenship is in heaven colonies of heaven this is what apostles are generating they are founding them like many cities within cities this is what they're doing to represent the agenda and culture of the kingdom. And that leads me to my final point. I'm almost done. I'm going to get there. But listen, fourth thing, okay? Personal agent, steward of the gospel, kingdom pioneer. Fourth thing, spiritual parent. This might be the most important of all of them, maybe aside from gospel part, but the colonies I just spoke of, they're really families. I mean, you read Paul's letters in the most prominent metaphor. The most obvious way he speaks about church is as household. God is Father, Jesus is kurios, Lord, household uh, authority, and then brothers and sisters. It, it's, it's a family affair. Apostles are fathers or mothers. They're, they're not just teachers, they're not just proclaimers, they're not just ministry organizers, they're spiritual parents. Paul says he's a father in 1 Corinthians 4.15 and 1 Thessalonians 2.11. He calls himself a mother. Galatians 4. 19 and 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 2 7. Galatians 4 19 says, I'm in labor with you. Like a pregnant mom giving birth. And then 1 Thessalonians 2, he's like, I was like a nursing mother to you. We don't often connect the idea of tenderness with apostles. Some people think of him like, ah, oh, these are bold, brash. And they read Paul's letters like, ah, oh, this is bold, brash. You know, he's just kind of like, that. bro, he was like a nursing mother. Apostles are parents. Okay? They, they're not just organizational directors. They have a personal relational investment in people. That's why they have such authority. Okay, this is not just about a ministry organization. I founded a ministry organization. Who cares? Are you raising a family? 
Are you building a household? See, that's apostolic work. That, the result of that is long-term connection. You ever wonder why Paul writes all these letters? I mean, bro, just move on. But no, see, when he plants churches in Corinth or Thessalonica or wherever, these are expressions of his own, you know, body, as it were, like children. It's not just, let me leave a deposit and run. Now, an evangelist might be more like that. They just want to get in there, break in the kingdom, and then move on to the next place. They may not establish these kinds of relationships. But apostles, it's like, once you're my child, you're always my child, no matter where you are in the world. So I'm going to write to you, Timothy. I'm going to write to you, Titus. I'm going to write to you, Corinthians, because, man, I gave birth to you guys. I'm going to write to you, Galatians. We're going to stay in touch because I'm a father. I'm not just a leader. Come on, somebody. I heard that. Amen. I'm a father. I'm a parent. We're not, I'm not a hired hand. I'm building a household. Not just an organization. They generate the culture, that means, of the household. Just like parents generate the culture of a family, apostles generate a culture for the body of Jesus. Okay, They're like a one-person culture or a, or a two-person culture, like a team. Paul and Timothy, Paul and Barnabas. They embody what the gospel calls for. That's why Paul can say crazy things like, imitate me. You know, follow me as I'm following him. Oh, that's arrogant. It's not arrogant. It's gracious. Because these are uh, half of these people that Paul writes to are pagan. They, they have no relationship with God of Israel, no understanding of the covenants, no knowledge of Abraham. I mean, they could have been worshiping Jupiter yesterday. And today they're born again. Now what? Well, meet us at church on Sunday morning for the coffee and discipleship. No! They need to know how to live. What do we do? Well, I'm still in the same, you know, small apartment with my wife and kids who worship Jupiter. I, I still got, I'm working for this man who makes me sacrifice every day to the gods of his household. What do we do? How do we do this? I don't know how to relate to God. Like everything from square one, apostles carry that around. And they should be able to say, listen, the way we live, you live. This is what he tells um, Timothy, look, everything you saw and heard that we did, do that and you'll be fine. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? Who can say that? Well, look, if an apostle is worth his salt, he can say that. If an apostle is worth her salt, she can say that. Because something mature and deep has been cultivated in their lives so that they can turn around and say, here's how the kingdom looks in flesh and blood. Now, come on, just step into this with me. Start integrating yourself into this culture. They orient people to the kingdom by the way that they live, by the way that they exist. I'm going to close with this. I know I'm a little over time. I apologize. Hope the stream hasn't shut off. You know that hook they used to have on Showtime at the Apollo. I'm waiting for that. Sandman to come on. Just real quick, 1 Thessalonians 2. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but again, if you, if you want to kind of have like a a mentality about apostles as parents who shape culture, who build families. Just think about 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 12. Um, let me start here with verse 7. We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother, taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our very own selves. Because you had become so dear to us. Do you hear that language? Like, we weren't just here to give you a message. We were here to give you ourselves. It's apostolic ministry. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You're witnesses. And God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Calls you into his kingdom and glory. You feel that parental like, come on. You guys, we're in this together. We, we got called by God to start a family with you and we want to raise you up into this culture in our household so that you can do it. You can live worthy. Let me close with this. Parents, what, what is our goal? If you have kids, what is your goal? Do you want your kids to be, you know, 45 years old, living in your basement, playing Nintendo? I hope not. 
No. When has the parent done his or her job? What we want is for our children to grow up and start their own households. Don't we? No, we want them to grow up and become fully functional human beings like adults, men and women, you know, who have embraced the reality of values and mission and vision and then turn around and pass it on to their children so that our children's children are walking in the way, flourishing in the kingdom. Come on, this is apostolic leadership. It's parental. It seeks to mobilize and develop children who turn around and can be released into their own callings in God. Too much leadership, as I started with this conversation, is about gathering people underneath us and keeping them there as long as humanly possible. Apostolic leadership is about being a parent in a house that raises children that at one point in time we can say to them, go, go start a family, go build a household, step into the work that you're called to. Yeah? Our relationship will never end, but it will change. Okay, my, I'm going to relate to you when you're 25 different than when you were two. If you're 25 and I'm still relating to you as if you were two, we got problems. So apostolic work is about these things, right? Kingdom, the personal agent, gospel steward, kingdom pioneer, spiritual parent. This is why apostles are so necessary in the body of Jesus. This is why they're so foundational. Because if those things are in play, then these other groups can flourish. The prophets can do their work. The evangelists can do their work. The, evan uh, the, the pastors and teachers can do their work without jealousy, without envy, without territorial arguments. Because the apostles can set the stage, they can lay the foundation along with prophets. And then the, these groups can do their work and then the whole body itself can be mobilized. And everybody becomes a builder and everybody becomes a contributor. So apostles, uh, they, they are a foundation in God's work in the body. And it's urgent, guys, that, that we pray for, uh, that we contend for uh, a true apostolic witness in our generation. Especially now. If we, if we never saw our need for it before, we do now. We need people who are pioneers, who will go places that nobody else wants to go. We need people who are stewards of the gospel and who will hold the body of Jesus accountable to the truth of God when everybody has an agenda and everybody has a, a, you know, some direction that they want to go in. We need people who are true parents, you know, who, who know how to raise kids. Strong, wise, pure, powerful kids who at a certain point can just step forward and take their place. And then we need people, again, who are personal agents of Jesus. So let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the word of Jesus Christ, for the gospel of our salvation. Thank you for the scripture that organizes our own hearts. And I pray for grace to submit ourselves to the mindset of the apostolic gospel afresh. I pray for those among us with apostolic callings and identities, Lord. Help them to come to you, to come and step forth and, and be trained in the fire of the body of Christ, just like Paul, so that at the right time they can be launched out, just like Paul. He didn't just start doing things on his own. He abided with you and then he was invited into a work in Antioch and then the Holy Spirit said, Now, set apart for me, Saul and Barnabas. Let us not be in a hurry. Those who are called with apostolic burdens, Lord, let us submit ourselves to you and your people. And may the Spirit speak and mobilize. I thank you for Uptown. I pray for these believers. I pray for their development into a fully orbed, powerful, effective body of Jesus Christ. And for all of us in this city, help us, Lord, to hear your voice and do your will. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I apologize for going too long. You guys are amazing, and um, you can send the bill for your time, your extra time. Send it to Jeremy. He's going to take care of that. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, if you would just go ahead and flood the comment section with your appreciation for him. I'm sure he'll be able to go back and see through um, like just how meaningful and instructional and uh, encouraging that was to hear um, from him this morning. Uh, as we get ready to uh, close this morning, uh, I want to remind you that we as a body will be um, coming together for communion on Zoom right after this um, service is concluded. So make sure you log in to, to the Zoom link. Uh, let's first um, 
uh, recite our benediction, our closing prayer with uh, Beatrice, Claret, and Miguel. Hi. Hi. Hi, Adventures. Today we want to invite you to recite the benediction with us. Lord, give me opportunities this week to help disrupt suffering and mend what is broken with the hope of Jesus. Where there is violence, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is poverty, help me to offer the resources I have. Where there is addiction, may I pray for the power of your freedom. Where there is loneliness, use me to foster community. Where there is an overabundance of convenience, teach me to sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, now we are going to say in Spanish. Señor, dame la oportunidad esta semana de interrumpir el sufrimiento y remendar lo que está quebrantado con la esperanza de Jesús. Donde haya violencia, hazme un instrumento de paz. Donde haya pobreza, ayúdame a ofrecer de los recursos que tengo. Donde haya adicción, que pueda orar por el poder de la libertad. Donde haya soledad, utilízame uh, para fomentar el compañerismo. Donde haya sobreabundancia de comodidad, enséñame a sacrificar. En el nombre de Jesús. Amén. Amén. Bye. Bye. As we get ready to close, as we get ready to leave, uh, I leave us with two questions. The first being, are you sensing and are you feeling that apostolic quality, that leadership within you, that God is um, birthing that you have been wired this way, that this is who God designed you and intended you to be. Do not run from that calling, but submit yourself to that, marinate in that, and let the Lord mold you, shape you, and lead you into that gifting and into that work. So that's the first question. Do you feel and do you sense God wiring you and leading you into that? Don't run from it, but submit yourself to it. And the second thing is, are we allowing ourselves to be mobilized, parented, and led by apostolic leadership? Those that Jesus has raised up in our lives, in our specific context, uh, in our church bodies, are we resisting their leadership or are we being uh, mobilized by their leadership? Those are two very important questions for us to ask ourselves and to think about uh, as we listen and marinate in what Jeff told us today. So let's pray one more time and then we will join on Zoom in a few minutes for communion. Heavenly Father, Thank you for your word today. Thank you for your kingdom. Thank you for structuring and organizing your people, us, in a way that is meant to build, that is meant Amen. to um, live out uh, and bring and spread uh, your kingdom, your glory, and your um, just who you are into this sinful and broken world. Thank you that that's why we have hope. And I just pray that today we would be challenged Challenge to be unleashed in our apostolic giftings and um, uh, identity, and also challenged and encouraged to follow and be mobilized by those that you have gifted and set in our lives with apostolic leadership. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you for being here, and we'll see you on Zoom in a few minutes. You'll see the link on the screen and in the comment section. Please join us for communion as we come together as the body of Christ. Thank you.